Today I am talking about Abigail Adams. One of the reasons that I love Drunk History is that it's how a lot of my friends talk about history when we're sober. Um, usually our version of it involves a lot less profanity and chasing of moths. I hang out with people that, you know, if somebody randomly goes, Salt Peter! John! Everybody cracks up. If you don't get that, go out and rent 1776 now. That's an order. And, and if you've seen 1776, you have an idea of the correspondence between John and Abigail that happened while she was in Massachusetts trying to hold their farm together and raise their kids and generally not go insane. And he was in Philadelphia arguing with all the delegates of the Continental Congress, grumbling at everyone in sight and trying to not go insane. Just pick a random letter and read it because they're so sweet and so smart. It's not just love letters back and forth and it's not just family news, it's, you know, she is really interested in what's going on and what these people are deciding about the fate of this brand new country. As they're putting their laws together, this is her advice to him. I desire that you remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. An entire new country is being founded on the principle that, um, excuse me, you cannot govern, you, you cannot establish laws and expect us to follow them if we have no representation you know, tea in the harbor, all of that stuff was about representation. My favorite quote, it's the one that I opened my Drunk History video with, which is, I've always felt that a person's intelligence is directly influenced by the number of conflicting points of view he can entertain simultaneously on the same topic. Now the actual Drunk History segment that my entry is a reaction to was about the election of 1800 and the horrendous mudslinging war that went on between Adams and Jefferson in that campaign. There's this guy named Callender who was fined under a law that was on the books that Jefferson felt was unconstitutional. I'm not sure whether it was actually libel or slander against the president. Jefferson's position was that you should be able to say whatever you want about whoever you want. So the letters that went back and forth between Abigail Adams and Thomas Jefferson in 1804, um, it started in May, hadn't you know, really been on speaking terms since the campaign, um, and then she heard that Mary Jefferson, uh, uh, who was only 25, uh, Jefferson's daughter, had died. This was a young woman that she had kind of been a surrogate mother to when she was a little girl. I think she felt guilty for not writing sooner, but basically she kind of sideways and doesn't quite apologize for, you know, waiting it out because they were on the outs. Um, and But then she's finally like, no, you know, I love this kid and I know what it is to be a parent and he must be, he, this must just be killing him and I really need to write something. So she wrote something. And Jefferson came back with, well, thank you, that was so nice of you. As far as the thing of us not being friends anymore, well, you know, there was only one thing your husband ever did that I really took very as personally unkind, and that was the business with the cabinet appointment. So when he left office, he appointed a bunch of guys that Jefferson really, really did not see eye to eye with that he then had to deal with in the cabinet. Well, he started it, and he started it, and then, and So. After she got that reply, <laughs> I have never felt any enmity towards you, sir, for being elected President of the United States. But the instruments made use of, and the means which were practiced to effect a change, have my utter abhorrence and detestation, for they were the blackest calumny and foulest falsehoods. I had witnessed enough of the anxiety and solicitude, the envy, jealousy, and reproach attendant upon the office as well as the high responsibility of the station 
to be perfectly willing to see a transfer of it. And I can truly say that at the time of election, I considered your pretensions much superior to his to whom an equal vote was given. I'm not entirely sure what she means by that last part, but I think it's a dig. If you feel yourself a free man and can act in all cases according to your own sentiments, opinions, and judgment, you can do more than either of your predecessors could and are awfully responsible to God and your country for the measures of your administration. And then she goes on to talk about how one of the first things he did, Jefferson did in his administration, was pardon this guy Calendar. So he writes back to her, again in July, with his side of that particular story. She writes to him, 18 August, 1804, Sir, he's still Sir, your statement inspecting Calendar and your motives for liberating him wear a different aspect as explained by you from the impression which the act had made not only upon my mind, but upon the minds of all those whom I have ever heard speak upon the subject. With regard to the law under which he was punished, different persons entertain different opinions respecting it. I have ever understood that the power which makes a law is only competent to the repeal of it. If a chief magistrate can by his will annul it, where is the difference between a republican and a despotic government? With these sentiments, mind you, these sentiments of, gee gosh darn, it's too bad we can't be friends anymore. With these sentiments, I reciprocate my sincere wishes for your health and happiness, Abigail Adams. If you're one of those people who's like, oh, those kids, they don't like, they don't pay attention to history anymore, I challenge you to look at the Abigail Adams tag on Tumblr because, dude, there are teens and millennials all over the place who are like, this lady was awesome. And of course, we've seen her on Drunk History within the last year. We've also seen her on Sleepy Hollow, which I, I, I loved the idea of her playing detective, the execution. Well, I have a complicated relationship with the second season of Sleepy Hollow, so we'll just leave it there. Hands down, Laura Linney in the John Adams miniseries that was on HBO a few years ago. Oh my god, amazing. So, so, so good. You have to see it. And also, uh, 1776. That scene where he's kind of imagining talking to her in the bell tower, which, I, which represents kind of the, the, the correspondence, it's just, I, it makes me cry every time. If it is not yet March 2nd, you can still go to my Drunk History video and vote for me. Please vote for me. I will put some links if you want to learn more about Abigail Adams in the description. And I will see you next time. Bye-bye! And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you diss the President of the United States. <laughs>